Randy Bennett and the Gales had their sights set on sweeping the Zags and finishing the WCC regular season undefeated. But Mark Few and the Bulldogs, well, they had other plans. And now the Zags look like a team getting a real favorable seed in March. You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Happy Monday and welcome in to the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to bring you news and updates on all things Zag athletics. Today's episode of Locked On Zags is brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things just a little bit further? Do you ever wonder what adventure could be just around the next corner? Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Check them all out at NissanUSA.com. Folks, for those of you on YouTube, you'll see I have a different background today on a little mini vacation. And what a time to get to spend some time away reveling in a massive week for the Gonzaga Bulldogs. We had the win against San Francisco on Thursday. That was a big one. We knew they needed to pick that one up, put a little less pressure on themselves to still make sure uh, they come into that game against St. Mary's, not feeling the whole weight of the world on their shoulders. Whether they felt that or not, who knows, but they did not look like a team stressing whatsoever. Came out and absolutely pounded down the gales in Moraga. 70 to 57 was the final score. Folks, it wasn't even that close. I assume most of you watched this game. If you missed this game, uh, incredible performance from the Zags, top to bottom. All seven Zags who played contributed positively, not quite the same amount of offensive output you'd expect from Nolan Hickman, but he distributed the ball really well. We'll get to that. Uh, Anton Watson didn't score a lot of points, played great defense, switched out well uh, on or on St. Mary's as bigs, uh, on guards, excuse me. Really great performances from Graham E.K. and Ryan Nembhard, though. I mean, those two guys looked absolutely incredible in this game. 24-10 and 10 for E.K. on 11 of 20 shooting for him, including 2 of 2 from the free throw line. Ryan Nembhard had 20 and 10 assists on 9 of 15 shooting. He's the first Zag to get a 20 and 10 assist game since his older brother Andrew did it against BYU. And like I said, St. Mary's, they were hoping to secure a sweep of the WCC, not only a sweep of Gonzaga, but winning every game in the WCC regular season. The last time a non-Gonzaga team did that was 1992. The Pepperdine Waves, led by Doug Christie, who had a lengthy NBA career uh, playing for Toronto and Sacramento. That's the last time this happened. Gonzaga, in that stretch, has done it six times. But no other team has done it. Gonzaga made sure that did not happen. Today is Mailbag Monday, so we are going to take some mailbag questions here to round out the show, talking about this win, talking about some WCC potential matchups as they get into the tournament, what some seeding stuff might look like, comparing some resumes. We'll talk about the women's basketball team as they finished up their regular season as well. First question of the show here comes from Jeff via Gmail. Jeff says, Gonzaga completely dominated St. Mary's in the paint. Is it more a result of A, St. Mary's thin front line, especially missing Jefferson? B, Gonzaga just playing better than the first game against St. Mary's? C, a combination of those factors? Or D, something else? Well, yeah, it's a combo. It's a it's combination for sure. Mason Forbes replaced Joshua Jefferson in the starting lineup. Here's the thing. Mason Forbes, really good defensive player. St. Mary's didn't is arguably not missing a ton defensively with Mason Forbes replacing Joshua Jefferson. Now, even if you think Forbes is the same level of defensive player as Jefferson, you're still losing depth. You're still not as a, able to be as aggressive defensively because foul trouble can be more of a problem. So it's still a loss. But the other main issue is that Jefferson, much better offensive player than Mason Forbes. Gonzaga didn't guard Mason Forbes outside of the perimeter whatsoever. They were able to kind of play four on five with him on the floor. Luke Barrett wasn't super confident, passed up a lot of open threes in this game, it felt like. So St. Mary's offense just looked a lot more stagnated because they didn't have Jefferson. But Gonzaga played better. Graham E.K. has been phenomenal the last two weeks. He didn't play that bad the first game against these two teams with the problem. A, he got in some foul trouble. Braden Huff didn't play well as, as his replacement. But the key was Ryan Nembhard. Ryan Nembhard's ability to just gash St. Mary's defense. Whenever he wanted to get into the paint, he could get into the paint. 
They did that little short pick and roll where he gets into the paint, makes the little baby bounce pass to Graham E.K. St. Mary's could not figure out how to defend that. They could not stop that. Their guards were unable to stop Ryan Nembard from getting where he wanted to go, when he wanted to go. His ability to break down a defense. It was, it's been there all year long, but consistently, the way he has done it lately, you can tell he is much more comfortable in this offense with these teammates. And that growth from him, from the beginning of the season, from the February 3rd game against St. Mary's till now, the growth that Ryan Nembard has had is the reason more than anything else. And there's been a lot of things, but more than anything else, that is the reason Gonzaga is in this spot where they have two big time wins, quad one wins, road wins, and are now in the position that they're in looking much more comfortably at a spot in the NCAA tournament. Next question comes uh, and kind of answered. I, I sort of answered it already for you, Austin. My apologies. Uh, Austin via Discord says, over the past two games, what was more impressive, EK scoring or Nemhart's ability to navigate and break down the opposing defense? Hickman only scored four points against St. Mary's, but he had a season high of seven assists. Is it more impressive he had seven assists or more concerning he had four points? So I'm going to lump those together because I kind of already talked on the Nemhart thing. I will say Nemhart's ability to break down a defense is more impressive than EK scoring because it is the reason for EK's successful scoring. Not directly, but indirectly in a lot of ways. Ryan Nembhard getting Graham EK open looks around the rim is the reason he's shooting 75 plus percent. Again, EK has also made tough shots. He has made tough shots over contested defenders. He hit shots in Mitchell Saxon's face. There are not a lot of people in this league that do that. There are not a lot of people in college basketball who do that to Mitchell Saxon. He is a very, very good defensive player. But by and large, Nemhard's ability to, to tear apart defenses is what has led to EK's strong performances offensively. Regarding the Hickman stuff, yeah, I'm not concerned about a four-point game from Nolan Hickman in a game where Gonzaga very clearly had a game plan to execute offensively, and they did it. The game plan was not for Nolan Hickman to hunt his shot from beyond the arc. It was not for Nolan Hickman to put his head down and drive to the basket and try to score. I think more of that would have been welcome because Ryan Nembhard did it quite a bit. But that was part of it. Ryan Nembhard and Graham E.K.'s two-man game was working really well. Why, why do anything different? Anton Watson also didn't have a good offensive game, but that's okay. Nolan Hickman was great defensively. Like you said, he had seven assists. That's fantastic. His bounce pass to Braden Huff was one of the most impressive passes I've seen. If you missed the game, go look up that highlight. It is a really beautiful pass from Nolan Hickman. So no, no concern for Hickman having a slower game offensively. I think it was partly a game, just game flow situation. And Hickman did some other fantastic stuff. He was also great defensively on St. Mary's as two guards. Those two guys, both Mahanian and uh, Marcelonis, both had rough games. And I think Hickman's defensive disruption was a big part of that as well. Uh, this next question, for those of you who are on the Discord channel, you know you've been waiting for this particular individual to ask a question to try to make me read their username out loud on the show. I'm sorry, I'm not going to do it. Uh, if you want to see what it is, join the Discord channel. It is free. There is a link in the show notes. You can click in there. I am sure we will be discussing it after this show comes out. Fantastic question, though. I'm going to read it here. In the span of the last few weeks, the 23-24 Gonzaga Bulldogs have gone from needing an auto bid to go to the NCAA tournament to an NCAA tournament lock to looking like a second weekend team. Consistently great scoring from Hickman and Nemhard. Timmy-esque numbers from an unstoppable EK and contributions from the bench have gotten the team here. What's needed to take the next step? I think the biggest things for Gonzaga are consistency related. Consistency on the defensive end of the floor, consistency from the reserves. Those are the things this team needs to go from where they are now, which is incredibly good, to truly great. And they need to get there soon, in the next three weeks, in order to be in the spot where they can be in the Sweet 16, or even push beyond that. It's wild to be talking about pushing past the Sweet 16 when a lot of people a week ago, a month ago, three months ago in particular, were, I just want to be in the tournament. I just want to make the NCAA tournament, if we lose the first round game, that's fine. I just want to get there. Now we're talking about what does this team need to do to be, you know, back in the Sweet 16 again, even further. And the things that I think it are, are the things that I think they need to do are more consistently defensively. We've seen lapses. We've seen 10 minute stretches where the team goes on a 9-0 run, 10-0 run, whatever it may be, uh, and just scores at will because Gonzaga's getting sloppy in the pick and roll defense. They're not being able to find shooters and the team's overall defense has been much better, but that consistency is the key that needs to change. And then reserves. Dusty Stromer has been great lately, 
but he wasn't great for a period of time. He was adjusting to a new role. He was adjusting to now coming off the bench. What was Gonzaga asking him to do? What did he need to do? He seems to have found that, but can he be that consistently, especially as we get in the NCAA tournament? Same with Braden Huff. Braden Huff and the defense kind of go together. Can he come into the game and play adequate enough defense that he can be a positive factor for the team offensively while not causing them problems on the other end of the floor? Because if not, Graham E.K. needs to play 38 minutes a game. If that's the case, Graham E.K. needs to not foul. If that's the case, Graham E.K. can't be as aggressive defensively. It causes Gonzaga problems. So I think the main things are Huff being able to be an ironclad seventh man, contri consistently contributing on both ends of the floor, and this team overall just sharpening up on the defensive end of the floor. Well, is this the best job that we have seen Mark Few do as the head coach of the Gonzaga Bulldogs? We're going to talk about that, as well as what is currently separating Gonzaga from being a top five seed in the 2024 NCAA tournament. More on all of that. Coming up after a word from today's sponsor, Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things just a little bit further? Do you ever wonder what kind of adventure could be just around the next corner? Because our friends at Nissan have a lineup of SUVs with the capabilities to take your adventure to the next level. First, there's the 2024 Nissan Rogue. It is the perfect car for city drives and great escapes. And if you need something, you can call on the class exclusive built-in Google Assistant. Gone are the days of connecting your phone. Google Assistant, Google Maps, and the Google Play Store are built right in to the 12.3-inch HD touchscreen infotainment system. The 2024 Rogue is the perfect mid-size crossover for your next adventure. Or how about the 2024 Nissan Pathfinder, which has room for up to eight, an expensive cargo capacity, and an advanced available 4x4 capability. With 284 horsepower and up to 6,000 pounds of towing capacity, when adventure calls, the Pathfinder is here to answer. So take the Nissan Rose, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. All right, folks, segment two, still Andy Patton, still Locked On Zags podcast, and we are still hammering through a very fun Mailbag Monday episode here after Gonzaga's 2-0 week on the road against the Dons of San Francisco and the Gales of St. Mary's in Moraga. This question here comes from Christian via Gmail. Christian says, is this one of the best seasons of coaching in Mark View's illustrious career? The Zags are gelling and peaking. The distribution of playing time appears to be dialed in, and the players are embracing their roles. It is very tough for me as an outsider to evaluate the quality of the coaching job done by Mark Few. I will say that anybody outside of people directly involved with the uh, with the program on a day-to-day -day basis would probably tell you that. I'll, I'll say this, should probably tell you that. Anybody who confidently tells you how good Mark Few has done coaching, there's just so many factors. You have to coach up players who... You know, you're coaching up guys who are new to the program, new to their roles, new to the system, new to college athletics. It's just a, a variety of different things. Having said all of that, the big old caveat, it's hard to imagine this isn't near the top of this list. The growth that this team has gone through from the start of the year to the midpoint of the year to a month ago to now, the growth that has happened. And part of it is just, Mark Few, most teams don't like to build their program adding a bunch of transfers and forcing them all to, to learn to play together at the last minute. That's not how teams want to build their rosters. Some teams are going real heavy into the transfer portal, but Rick Pitino said in a press conference recently, he's not having any fun because it is hard to build a team of entirely transfers and have success. Some teams are doing it. Some teams are struggling. It's hard. Mark Few has typically used the transfer portal to supplement key pieces, find players who he thinks can fit a definitive role, coach that player up into fitting into that role, and then let them explode. We've seen that time and time and time again. When you add key starters from the transfer portal, when you suddenly have a freshman starting you're not expecting, when you're asking a player who's been here for four years to suddenly become an offensive focal point, it is a lot of different asks from different players. And to get to the point where all of those players are now filling those roles, and some of them have changed. They ask, the, the ask from Dusty Stromer changed. The ask from Braden Huff changed. The ask from Ben Gregg changed. To an extent, the ask for Anton Watson changed. They're no longer asking him to be the offensive focal point. That has shifted to Graham E.K. Nolan Hickman switched positions. Like the amount of different asks that Mark Few has out. This is what I want you to be. This is the role I want you to fill. This is where we operate the best. The fact that the team is meeting those expectations. And I'm sure there are certain guys who are not. 
maybe guys who aren't playing, who maybe Mark Few attempted to play rotation minutes earlier in the year, and it just hasn't come together. But for the most part, it appears the players are at the point where they're executing what is being asked of them in this offense and in this defense. That is really hard to do. And I think Mark Few's ability to figure out which players he could continue to push in that direction to get them to meet the the expectations versus which players he needed to change the expectations, whether it's changing the starting lineup, whether it's changing the minutes distribution, whatever it may be, whether it's just moving them around on defense because they're not able to do a certain thing, like whatever it may be, stuff that I'm not necessarily even seeing. Mark Few has seemed to find the puzzle pieces and put them together at a time where this team is thriving right now. He's done this most years. That's why it's hard to compare. It's not like this is new. They don't usually struggle as much as they did at the beginning of the year. At least they haven't for the last half decade or so. But Gonzaga teams getting better in February and March is not new. This team just happens to be extra dramatic, which is why I think, yes, this is probably towards the top of that list. But I'm sure there were some early seasons where there was some big growth throughout the year as well. So hard to say it's the best, but certainly one of the most impressive ones that I've ever seen. Next question comes from Jamie via Gmail. Jamie says, what is the difference between a team like Auburn and Gonzaga in the bracketologist's eyes? Like Gonzaga, Auburn has a great net ranking, but they're just one in seven in quad one games, and they're projected by most to be a four seed, while the Zags were supposedly on the bubble until Saturday when they picked up their third quad one win. Even if Auburn is 10-ish spots higher in the net, it seems like this should be offset by the Zags' stronger quad one resume. All right, there's a lot to unpack here. Probably not enough time to get to all of it. Here are a couple things that I will say. The emphasis on quad one record specifically is a bit overblown. I say that as a personal opinion for starters. I also say that as the net factors that in. So if the net has Auburn higher and you're saying, well, Auburn's higher in the net, but they have a worse quad one record, the net has already factored that in. It's already being considered as part of their overall net ranking. Quad one record should not supersede the net ranking. And I say this not as an attack on Auburn, more of like Gonzaga had a bad quad one record until last week, and they were very high in the net ranking. And a lot of people were like, how is this team in the top 20 in the net when they have a one in five quad one record? It's because quad one record is not the sole thing that should be evaluated when you're talking about overall resumes. Auburn in particular, they're eight and in quad two. Gonzaga's three and one. And they're only three and one because USC finally got their crap together enough to win a game this last week. And they actually beat Washington, which has bumped Washington to being 72nd, as I record this currently in the net. If they lose more games, they I think they're only remaining regular season game is Washington State. Uh, they could drop below top 75. That could actually cost Gonzaga a quad two loss. At this point, it doesn't matter because of those wins this last week. But that all that to say, Auburn has a much better quad two record. Yes, they are one in seven in quad one games. They blew out many of the teams that they have played. The metrics like blowouts. You can make an argument that they value them too much. That goes into the conversation that I briefly touched on last week that has been happening around college basketball where uh, ACC's uh, Clemson's head coach in the ACC, Brad Barnell, uh, is accusing Big Ten schools, Big 12 schools, excuse me, of effectively gaming the net system by playing a bunch of not so good teams in the non-conference, blowing them out, building up their net ranking. And then when they all play each other, they get more quad one and quad two opportunities. He's kind of right. That is kind of what the Big 12 is doing. Nobody's stopping them from doing that. Nobody's stopping the ACC from doing the same thing. But all that's to point out, Auburn's net ranking is where it is because of how the system evaluates them. The bracketologists are not necessarily all using net exclusively. They should not be, at least. They can all do it however they want to do it. But net is a tool to be used. It is not the entire thing. Auburn has a good resume. They are one in seven in quad one. That is the stain on their otherwise solid resume. They have more quad one opportunities. If they don't pick them up, if they end up losing early in the SEC tournament and are something like one in 10 in quad one games, they're not going to get a four seed. They're going to drop. They'll drop to a five or a six seed. Guess what? There's a realistic chance Gonzaga is a six seed. So this could even out. It could even out where Auburn and Gonzaga are both six seeds. I would not be shocked if that happens. If it doesn't happen, it's because Auburn picked up a couple more quad one wins. They end up three and nine or something like that, three and eight, three and seven. Then they probably deserve to be in that conversation. There is, I get the argument. 
Gonzaga is not a four seed. They don't deserve to be a four seed because of the losses that they have, but they are, they certainly didn't deserve to be on the bubble. And I already kind of alluded to that, which is why I didn't want to get into that. Yes. They were listed by some as a bubble team up until this weekend. I don't think they were ever actually that realistically of a bubble team, but I do understand why Auburn is considered higher than them right now. Uh, even if their quad one record isn't as good. Next question here comes from Jeff via Gmail. Jeff says, Gonzaga has played San Francisco in the semis of the WCC tournament, three of the last four and four of the last six tournaments. Seems likely the Zags will play them in the WCC semis again. Would you like to see Gonzaga play San Fran again or somebody else? Also, San Francisco has not beat Gonzaga since 1998 in the WCC tournament. Uh, what does Gonzaga need to do to keep that streak going? Yeah, I mean, I'd rather see LMU pull off an upset or somebody else like that just because I think it's an easier matchup for Gonzaga at this point whether that win in the semifinals to get to the championship is a quad two or a quad three or whatever, just doesn't matter. It doesn't matter for Gonzaga. So I would rather play somebody not as good as San Francisco so that Gonzaga can have an easier path to a victory, be more prepared for that game against St. Mary's in the championship. But if it is San Francisco, Gonzaga doesn't have to do anything different. That's the nice thing. They'll watch the film. They'll watch what happened in the first half, the things that they didn't like. They'll make adjustments. They'll make shifts, all that stuff, and they should. But ultimately, the game plan of give the ball to Graham E.K., get out of his way, let him score, let him draw contact, let him get to the free throw line, put that team in, in foul trouble and make them have to scramble for rotations, that should be the same exact strategy. And until Coach Chris Curlison comes out with something different, which he will because he's a very good coach, Sean Farnham alluded multiple times during that game that they should probably run a zone to try to neutralize E.K. I wouldn't be surprised – if San Francisco attempts that next Monday, assuming that's the matchup that we see between these two teams. But for Gonzaga, they should just continue to do what they have done because it has worked against San Francisco the last two times, and it will probably work again unless they can find a completely different way to neutralize it. Next question comes from Christian via Gmail. Christian says, what is the best tournament destination for both Gonzaga basketball teams, whether it's geographic region and seating and or opponents? So for the men, the best case scenario is they get a six seed in Spokane. It's probably not going to happen. It's probably not going to happen. But a six seed in Spokane against play-in 11s, because remember, the 11 seeds are often where they use those two play-in games. You'll have some play-in games with 16 seeds, some play-in games with 11 seeds. Something like New Mexico and St. John's, who are both projected on the bubble right now. If it's those two teams playing each other, whoever wins plays Gonzaga in Spokane, huge, huge win for Gonzaga. Massive, massive advantage that they get. Again, I don't think the committee is going to do this. If I was Rick Pitino, by the way, and I had to play in New Mexico and play, play in against New Mexico to, to get an 11 seed to play Gonzaga and Spokane, I'd be pissed. Now the committee is going to turn to Rick Pitino and say, your resume is not very good. You're lucky you're even here, which is true, but I, it's why I don't think Gonzaga will actually get that ultimate dream spot of a six seed in Spokane. Uh, in my mind, the three seed would be either Alabama or Kansas. If we're just trying to chef's kiss this thing because Kansas has really struggled on the road. They're not going to want to come to Spokane uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Kansas is very good, but they, they're they struggling right now. They have some serious depth issues. I think I think Gonzaga could take them. Uh, Alabama is one of the worst defensive teams that is in the top 15 of the country right now. I think Gonzaga would hang 100 on Alabama. I think Alabama is offensively good enough to hang close to 100 on Gonzaga as well, but for a 3-6 game, if it was in Spokane, I like Gonzaga to win against Alabama. I also like it to be a really entertaining game. For the women's, they're going to be in Portland, most likely. Uh, we'll talk about this more in a later question, but there's a good chance they sew up getting a four seed in Portland, hosting that regional. Five seed could be Oregon State. They're right in that conversation. They could end up being in Portland. Uh, Stanford as the one seed would be super ideal. I think Gonzaga can take Oregon State. They're a good team, but I think Gonzaga can win that one. Gonzaga has already beat Stanford. Certainly Stanford will be ready. Cameron Brink will be healthy for the full game, most likely. That's going to make that a much harder matchup. But if Gonzaga is a four seed with Oregon State and Stanford in their in their um, uh, pod, you got to feel pretty good about the spot that you're in at that spot. Well, I'm going to talk about how the rankings come together. I'm going to talk more on the Gonzaga women's team's potential seeding in March. All of that coming up after a word from today's sponsor, FanDuel. Folks, get buckets with your first bet on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 in your pocket if your bet wins. So bet on all your favorite Zags in the NBA players and your favorite teams with quick bets, live same-game parlays, exclusive props, and more. Mark Few Zags right now are plus 1,900 to make the Final Four. And look, 
the way they're playing right now, it might be worth tossing ten dollars down. You get ten dollars down, they make it to the final four. You get one hundred and ninety plus your original ten back. That's two hundred bucks plus you're watching the Zags in the final four. It is a good good deal. So just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and shoot your shot. FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NBA. All right, folks, closing out the show today, continuing Mailbag Monday. This next question comes from Christian via Gmail. Christian says, comparing and contrasting the various ranking systems currently utilized in college basketball, what do you utilize and rely on to create your rankings for Locked On College Basketball? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm sure everybody does it differently. Obviously, the AP voters, there's a couple hundred of them, uh, certainly variety of different strategies and, and things that matter more to them. For me personally, for Locked On College Basketball, the top 25 that we do, every single week. I don't use net very much at all. I use primarily Ken Palm and I use their most recent records to make any quick determinations of like, oh, they went 0 and 2 this week, 0 and 3 in the last two weeks, 1 and 3, 3 and 0, whatever it may be. And I kind of use that to make small moves. And then I kind of go back through and look at their overall body of work, uh, their you know history head to head, if that matters, and kind of try to, try to make a, a top 25 that encompasses the best 25 teams in college basketball purely from a, these are the best teams. If they played head to head, this team would win. If they played head to head, this team would win versus which teams are hot right now, which teams are struggling right now. When should that matter? How much should that matter? Uh, and it's tough. It's it's kind of tough to compare. I, I, one that I struggled with recently was I think two or three weeks ago was Wisconsin. Wisconsin was lost five of six. They were really struggling, not winning games in the big 10. They were not playing anywhere close to a top 25 caliber team. They were losing to teams in the Big Ten that were outside the top 50, 60, 70 uh, at Ken Palm. But their overall resume, because of their strength of their non-conference schedule, because of how they did at the start of the Big Ten, it was like, this is a resume of a top 25 team, unquestionably. Ken Palm said so, Net said so, uh, Quad One Record said so, but it's like, they're not playing like that. I would rather reward, you know, again, this is a couple of weeks ago, reward a Colorado State, reward a New Mexico, a Boise State, or not Mountain West teams reward uh, Washington State at that time or somebody like that. And it was hard to make that determination because I do think Wisconsin even then was one of the top 25 teams in the country. Now they're not, they haven't been in my rankings for a while because they've slipped off, but it is tough to make those decisions. I don't envy the people who have to do it and get far more scrutiny than we get for doing it on Locked On College Basketball. Although I do write up my rankings into an article every week at USA Today. For those who want to check it out, go find me on Twitter, Andy Patton CBB. I post it there once per week. All right, next question comes from Jackie via Discord. Jackie says, if you were to build an eight-man team to contend for the NCAA championship from any players in the WCC over the past five years, what would your roster look like? I'll make it tough. You only get to pick two Zags. Yeah, I thought about this for a while. A lot of fun, different opportunities here. Uh, I'll say right now, the two Zags that I have selected for this roster, I'm trying to find, I'm trying to win a championship. My two Zags were Chet Holmgren and Jalen Suggs. Not a lot of mystery there. Love Drew Timmy, love Corey Kispert, love a handful of other players in Gonzaga's history, but one of guys who impact the game on both offense and defense felt like Jalen and Chet really kind of embodied that. So starting lineup, Chet Holmgren at the five, Kessler Edwards from Pepperdine at the four, Jalen Williams, Chet's current teammate with the Oklahoma City Thunder. Williams is my starting three coming from Santa Clara. Uh, Jalen Suggs again at the two, and then Brandon Pajemski from Santa Clara at the one. Suggs and Pajemski could kind of trade off. They're both big, big guards, bigger guards, capable scorers. I just like that. Dy capable defenders too. I like that. Jalen Williams is such a great shooter. Edwards is a good shooter. Chet's a good shooter. You can space the floor with all your bigs. You have great defense with Suggs and Chet in particular. Kessler Edwards is a good defensive player as well. And then my three backups. I immediately put Jamari Bouye from San Francisco on there. He's fantastic. I'd love to have him as a backup point guard for this team. He's a little smaller, but can run the one comfortably and, and let Pajemski or Suggs slide off the ball. Uh, and then I picked Mitchell Saxon in the front court, and I was really tough between Mitchell Saxon. I thought about Jonathan Mobo at San Francisco. I thought about Malik Fitz at St. Mary's. He was incredible, but I just wanted size. I, Chet's a good rebounder. He's a good shot blocker, but I wanted somebody who could really be that defensive anchor when Chet's not on the floor. Or, I mean, you could play Saxon at the five. You could slide Chet down to the four, and you'd have two elite rim protectors, really good big bodied guys, or at least Saxon's a little bit more big bodied than Chet, but you could kind of rotate Chet in and out that way. And then my last spot went to Alex Barcelo. I felt like I wanted somebody from BYU. Barcelo was a elite 
elite three-point shooter, another bigger guard. I think this lineup has size, length, good defensive ability. Everybody basically can shoot threes except Saxon. Like this is a really, really good dynamic, versatile team. And I think they could truly contend for a national championship. Final question of the show here. I assume two more questions on the show, both coming from Jeff via Gmail. Jeff says, any thoughts on the Gonzaga women finally breaking through as a four seed in the women's bracket reveal on Thursday night? Not only were the Gonzaga women a four seed, they were the 15th overall seed and the 14th seed Colorado was blown out by Oregon State on Saturday night. Seems like if the WCC tournament title goes to Gonzaga, they'll get a four seed and the chance to host the first two rounds of the NCAA tournament. What do you think? Yep, I agree. I don't really have a lot to add to that. I think Gonzaga is going to be a four seed now in the NCAA tournament, assuming they win the WCC tournament. I am still, I, I don't think it's locked. I don't think it's locked. I will say that only because this, it just feels like Gonzaga's team has not gotten the respect they deserve. And I could see a situation where Oregon state goes on a big run in the PAC 12 tournament or something else changes or even Colorado goes on a big run, you know, gets back from this loss, goes on a big run in the Pac-12 tournament, and they bump Gonzaga. I could see it happening. I think right now they're very, very likely going to be a four seed in Portland in the NCAA tournament, but I don't think that it is a lock just yet. And final question again from Jeff. He says, what are your favorite things about the WCC tournament being in Las Vegas? Well, I like that the WCC was an innovator. I like that they agreed to this a long time ago and, and kind of helped spearhead a movement of conferences not having their conference tournament at a local team's arena. Uh, Gloria Navarez had a big role in spearheading that and getting this conference to be kind of at the cutting edge of that at the Orleans Arena and doing doing what they do. Uh, I think that's huge. Uh, I love that it's a pro Zag crowd. I love the camaraderie, the uh, uh, opportunity to meet up in a central town in Las Vegas and, and, you know, people I haven't seen in a long time go and I get to see them and see my friends and, and see people like that. I think that's really fun. Uh, I worked at UP for a couple of years, so we got to go uh, much earlier than a lot of Gonzaga fans got to go, but I always enjoyed getting to go and going to a, a, a town that's known for a lot of parties, a lot of good food, a lot of uh, that kind of fun atmosphere. So it was always a blast to get a chance to go as a student at Gonzaga, as an employee at the University of Portland, and now just getting to go in this capacity uh, is fun as well. It's going to wrap it up for me today here on the Locked On Zags podcast. Thank you so much to those of you who have made the show your first listen or your first watch of the day. Remind you to join the Discord channel, not only to learn our mystery user's uh, username, but just to come in and hang out. We're talking Zags 24-7 in there. Link in the show notes on audio and video platforms. I'll be back on Tuesday with more talk about where Gonzaga is in the AP poll, what their net ranking looks like, getting you ready for the rest of the week as we get into the start of the WCC tournament and Gonzaga's, of course, role in that coming up later, uh, or I guess next week. That's going to wrap it up. Thanks again. And until next time, as always, go Zags.